Hello, it's day three at the third international conference on dengue and dengue hemorrhagic fever here in Bangkok, where I'm joined in conversation by Dr. Victor Gan from the Communicable Diseases Center at Tang Tok Seng Hospital in Singapore. Dr. Gan, welcome. Thank you for having me today. Dr. Gan, your presentation was on utility of warning signs, severe dengue and guiding admission. Can you elaborate a bit on that, please? Yes, so we will try to examine the utility of warning signs as a guide for admission to hospital. The background to this topic is that um, the big challenge in dengue management is the decision of whom to admit to hospitals and whom to monitor in outpatient clinics. Um, admitting too many patients into the wards and hospitals put a great burden on our inpatient care system. And so, with uh, the publication of dengue WHO guidelines in 2009, a new set of recommendations was set out re uh, asking clinicians to use uh, a list of warning signs to determine patients that needed admission and close monitoring. This was a change from previous WHO guidelines and we wanted to use the opportunity to evaluate and compare previous recommendations with the 2009 recommendations to see if uh, what impact it would have on our patient load as well as whether these uh, recommendations would increase our sensitivity of picking up severe dengue cases. And can you talk a little bit about the findings? What, one of the things we found straight off was that comparing our existing admission practice, which was largely based on uh, existing uh, WHO guidelines, our admission rate was approximately 20% from our outpatient clinics. Using the warning signs, uh, that is the new 2009 guidelines, this would have raised our admission rate to almost 50, to more than 50 percent. This uh, increase of 30 percent or so would have led to a greater burden on our healthcare resources requiring more, requiring more doctors, more inpatient beds, and stressing our healthcare system. Does this mean that priority um, is now being given to patients um, who exhibit more warning signs in terms of being admitted to a hospital? So this is what we are having to negotiate at the moment, how to implement the guidelines and how best to use the guidelines. Do we admit, follow the guidelines very strictly and admit everyone who has any warning signs at all, in which case our caseload would increase greatly? Um, our, let me share some of the other findings that we had from our, our research. Looking at um, the list of warning signs that WHO published includes uh, severe abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, lethargy, and a uh, rise in hematocrit with a decrease in platelet count. Uh, these are different signs and often patients may have one, two, or three of them. Also, these signs develop at different times during the illness. And in our small cohort, we found that uh, these signs often occurred only one day before progression to dengue hemorrhagic fever, which means they did not serve well as an early sign that patients were going to deteriorate in the future. When we look at each individual sign, none, not, not one of them proved to be very sensitive, as in we couldn't use any one of them or uh, to determine admission criteria by itself. However, we, we did see that patients with no warning signs at all, these patients were very unlikely to, to progress to severe forms of dengue illness. So if a patient never developed any warning sign at all, the negative predictive value was be between 90 to 100 percent, which means that it was very good at helping clinicians to decide which patients were safe to keep in outpatient setting. So these people didn't fall through the cracks, though, the people that did not exhibit early warning signs. Exactly. So we, we found that people with, that did not ever exhibit any warning signs, um, keeping them in outpatient care uh, was safe as because none of them, uh, well, you know, between 90 and 100 percent of the time, we were correct in determining that they did not progress to severe disease. Uh, the difficulty of evaluating guidelines is always that clinicians rarely follow one set of guidelines strictly. They always look at the patient as a whole, use their own uh, clinical judgment, as well as uh, evaluate the dynamic process of the disease. Um, so our analysis is then somewhat artificial in the sense that we applied 
the guidelines uh, hypothetically to a group of patients rather than actually evaluate what clinicians would do in the field. The, the, obviously, the, what we need to do in order to really evaluate whether guidelines are useful is to do a field trial where doctors actually use the guidelines in real life. That, that would be a much more accurate way to understand whether the guidelines would be useful. Dr. Gan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.